As time goes on, we can see a larger and larger collection of consoles that have garnered their spot and impact on gaming history. And I thought it'd be fun to take a look at the launch titles that went with these classic consoles. I strove for variety in my choices so that most console lines had a fair shake. So with that, welcome to my top 10 video game launch titles. Now this is my list and my list alone, and there were many solid choices to pick from. I'd love to hear what launch titles resonated with you the most in the comments down below. So with that said, let's begin. Number 10. The ultimate pinball game is, yes, ladies and gentlemen, a digital version. And I'm not talking full tilt pinball. That game has more to it. But no one needs more than the already perfect and perfectly free Space Cadet 3D. This game was a great addition to the PC in a time where the internet was shoddy at best. And sometimes you just wanted to do something fun on a PC. The game feels great. The sounds and flippers add a really nice touch. The blues, purples, reds, and yellows all work together in a fun fashion. For what this pinball game is, it's sleek, smooth, and fluid all around. Space Cadet 3D sold the PC for me. Without it, I would never have used a computer at all. I'd be scrounging for berries in the wilderness. No iPhone, no PC, no TV, nothing. I'd be completing hunts as a hermit in a lodge I made with my own two hands. Space Cadet 3D saved my life from being a hermit. Thank you, Space Cadet 3D. Thank you for being so much better than Ski Free and Solitaire. Number nine. What better way to launch a gaming cube than with a rolling sphere? Super Monkey Ball kicked off the GameCube in adorable, chibi fashion. I purchased Super Monkey Ball with my GameCube, of course. Admittedly, I bought it alongside Luigi's Mansion, which at first, Luigi's Mansion kinda bummed me out. Luckily, Super Monkey Ball got me way more hype at the time. I loved it, played it to death, and I must say, for a fun for the whole family kind of game, it is balls to the walls hard. It's no joke. This game takes a lot of patience, practice, and nose to the grindstone badass get good read. I think, looking back at it, I'd question my younger self's integrity watching how angrily I yelled at those adorable primates. Just a side note, it is readily apparent that this game was sponsored by Dole, and I'm perfectly fine with it. It matched the aesthetic perfectly well. I don't really see that it got me to buy more bananas or pineapples, though. Actually, did it get anyone to buy more bananas? Guys, go eat your fruits and vegetables. I don't, I don't know. Number eight. There's something to be said about a generic launch title that has maintained its spot in the top five best-selling video games of all time. Wii Sports' launch sold more of the Wii than any other launch title, still to this day, by many tens of millions of copies. But let's be honest, that's mainly because if you bought a Wii, you got Wii Sports for free. So by that logic, yeah, it's up there. But here's the thing. As a guy who sat out waiting with his friends in line at the Universal Studio City Boardwalk GameStop at midnight, who eventually got his Nintendo Wii at 6 a.m. with Twilight Princess and Nunchucks, I really, really enjoyed Wii Sports, you guys. The ad campaign was brilliant. Nintendo not only targeted kids, they really sold the parents on having fun with the whole family and being active at the same time. It was as if your parents were suddenly fine with you playing video games and encourage you to do so. And Wii Sports was that. Wii Sports is a prime example of how a game can be simple, readily understandable, extremely accessible, and be a solidly great game. I can't tell you how many parties or get-togethers I attended and saw Wii Sports running in the background for anyone to play. You got bowling, baseball, boxing, tennis, and golf. And if we're being real here, I personally spent a lot of time playing tennis and boxing. Whether you were lowbrow or highbrow, it did not matter. Wii Sports appealed to anyone and everyone. It truly brought people together and kept them around longer. Wii Sports was marketed at the peak of its perfection. Not to mention, Nintendo simultaneously introduced the human-like Miis in a way that never really reached that dangerously slippery uncanny valley that the other consoles did. Especially considering that you could make some really, really hideous abominations. Number seven. 
It's funny for me that a title that eventually became a multi-platform hit like Time Splitters really hits home for me. For combating my distaste for first-person shooters, this PS2 launch title subverted all prejudice I had against most FPSs. Time Splitters is a bit dark and definitely reminds you of an era that it came from, but that's what nostalgic glasses are for. You can't talk about Time Splitters without talking about GoldenEye 007 for the N64. It did so much for the genre, but Time Splitters? Time Splitters is what happens when the genre evolves in all the best ways. It's got smooth shooting, fluid movement, great gameplay modes, and satisfying sound designs that'll keep you on your toes. With David Doak's creation at work, Time Splitters was just satisfying carnage inside and out. Now the Time Splitters franchise has since then become a cult classic, and I think I speak for everyone. I hope that THQ Nordic brings the other games to the digital space. I think it's time we let Dr. Doak return to work as magic once again. Number six. I think I can safely say that Mario is the king of video games, and his first castle was the Nintendo Entertainment System. The impact of Super Mario Bros. is monumental. It defined a generation. It spurred many franchises, films even, unfortunately, and it helped gaming establish a foothold in the entertainment industry as a bona fide medium. Because we all know Mario and the lore so well, it can sometimes be hard to step back and boil him down to his first raw initial concepts. He was a plumber in identity clothing, and pipe traversal only. He was powered by strange mushrooms, plants with faces, or flashing, bouncing stars. His enemy is an enormous dragon turtle that accessorizes in black leather and spikes. Instead of being a knight saving a princess in distress from a castle, he's a plumber with a huge mustache saving a princess from a castle. Nothing really makes sense, but things make enough sense. It's truly bizarre, but nothing is overboard. Because we've gotten so used to each and every element in Mario, it all seems perfectly natural, organic, and purposeful. The way it all started is nothing short of miraculous. It embodies everything about the Nintendo Entertainment System. I love Mario and I love his not so humble beginnings. He's my champion and I am his. Let's create more content together, Mario. Let's -a go. Number five. Now, not precisely my cup of tea when it comes to games, but my respect for Halo Combat Evolved is immense. The farther we all are from the time Halo first came out, the more I appreciate its impact on the world. Halo launched the Xbox, defined its strong suit, and target audience all at once. I felt each subsequent installment never really recaptured the original few Halos. They all just seemed to go the route of higher graphics while cutting corners in style and aesthetics. Mass Effect, Halo 3, Destiny, and Warframe type games, while all being of varying qualities, Visually, they begin to blend together and become largely different takes on the same aesthetics. Halo's strength is that it stood out. It wasn't similar enough to any other games of the time or after. It had a unique style, setting, and vibe to it all. The narrative and core gameplay was fun and chaotic, while still giving the player all the control they needed. Bungie somehow recaptured this in the multiplayer as well. The graphics haven't aged well from the original Xbox, but the core gameplay still looks and feels clean, crisp, and satisfying. The controls were second to none. They were stable, balanced, and fluid. Halo is the great ancestor of basically every modern FPS we know today. Another strong aspect of Halo is the unique weapons and the equally unique enemies with their own characteristics, strengths, and even weaknesses. Halo Combat Evolved is a beautifully revolutionary, groundbreaking game that is still just as enjoyable today. For a launch game, it owned all the noobs around. It launched the Xbox in glorious fashion. Number four. The Dreamcast didn't really have the staying power, but damn if it didn't have the launch power. Soul Calibur, Power Stone, and my pick of the bunch, Sonic Adventure. It really started this console off right. The Dreamcast kicked off with a brand new 3D spin on the world's favorite hedgehog. At the time, myself, and I'm sure countless others, were blown the f away. There is this strange, indescribable, lovable quality about Sonic Adventure. It is a doofy game that you can't help but love. Most people today think that this game is hideous and buggy. I, on the other hand, still think it plays and looks well. I mean, it is the first true 3D Sonic game, so I don't know. Whatever it is for you, I'm sure someone on the internet will tell you you're wrong. The experience of the game is almost pure nostalgia for me, and I could play it on repeat for the rest of my life. And of course, because Sonic Adventure was one of the first games on the Dreamcast, 
you know it had to support the VMU minigames. These minigames were fun and dumb, especially when it came to chow breeding, but I'd be lying through my teeth if I did not admit that I went to grade school all the time with my VMU in my pocket. Gotta get my chow to the best level, baby! The soundtrack is rocking and quirky as hell and embodies the generation of late 90s gaming. Seriously, go back and listen to a handful of tracks. It's all over the place. Personally, I still prefer Sonic Adventure 2 over the first one, but the first game introduced so many characters for both good and for worse, and as the internet enjoys the memification of people who struggle to enjoy the game, I always find a way to enjoy this game every single time. Number three. This next one is a bit of a stretch because it was a launch title while also not being a launch title. While also seeing release on the Nintendo Wii U, you can't argue that The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild launched the Nintendo Switch. Now because I love this game so much, I felt like it didn't deserve disqualification for also catering to people who couldn't afford a brand new Switch. Simply put, Breath of the Wild is an open world game that takes place in the land of Hyrule. Your task is to defeat Ganon and save the realm. And that's it. Damn it, I just described every Zelda game Ever. But this is different because it's a sandbox! It's a big open world! You can do anything! And all the Japanese people are pulling off crazy tricks that I can never even think of. Look at how far this guy's flying! Everything else is still intrinsically and extrinsically motivating. If you want to help free the Guardians in each section of the world, you are totally welcome to. Doing so allows you to see their stories and aid yourself with new powers to ultimately help defeat Ganon. Along the way, you can do some side quests, pick up some Korok seeds, and learn about the game overall. But the real strength of Breath of the Wild is, as you learn and play it, you learn about yourself. What do you do first? What did you love most? How do you approach obstacles? How do you approach enemies? All of these answers are defining and different for everyone who plays the game. And I love that. It's so fascinating. Fascinating to me. The game is an avenue for complete exploration inside and out. I think it's important to recognize how much of a playground this game truly is, and that feat alone allows the player to choose how long their own individual journey is. Not only is Breath of the Wild an amazing Zelda game, an amazing open world game, and an amazing launch title, it's also the perfect entry for anyone that has or hasn't played a video game before. If you haven't played this game, I could not encourage encourage you strongly enough to do yourself a favor and play it. Number two. One of the most pivotal moves in gaming history was the 2D dominated jump to 3D style gaming with the big kahuna himself, Super Mario 64. I distinctly recall how excited I was for this game. It was yet again another revolutionary addition to gaming from a Mario game. For low poly shapes, Super Mario 64 still doesn't hurt to look at. The Bowser model is doopy and hilarious and spinning him around by his tail never gets old. Fans and speedrunners to this day are still finding new secrets. Streamers and Let's Players are making up teen challenging ways to play it. Mario 64 has truly pushed the envelope and set the trend for nearly every game today and of course the future of Mario games. The progressive jump mechanics, long jump, wall jump, ground pound, and dive moves combined with pretty solid physics in general made the platforming such a blast. Looking back, it amazes me how many new staple mechanics Mario 64 added to Mario's future. If you've played Mario 64, then systematically speaking, you know how to play Mario Sunshine, the Mario Galaxy series, and Mario Odyssey. And that's built on the genuine foundation of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just tweak it. Not once did I ever feel as though I wasn't given the right tools to surmount any obstacle. The mechanics also build off of and flow into each other. You can basically combo your jumps, all peppered in with familiar enemies, landmarks, and at the same time taking us to new territories. Like for instance, racing a gigantic penguin inside a weird ski resort cave, and then you follow that up by reuniting a baby penguin with its gigantic mama penguin. Man, this shit's weird. For a launch title, Super Mario 64 sold a lot of units. And at the time, and to this day, it's still an incredible game. Number one! So, what's the game? The number one launch game that Gerard thinks is the best one of all time. The one that's going to make you all mad and sad and feel something at the same time and want my head and blood in the streets. It's obviously the one, the only, Tetris. 
The true power of Tetris is the universal nature of its game. A person from literally every walk of life can consume it. There's no language barriers, there aren't any readily confusing mechanics, it's just simple and satisfying. Its exact gameplay is unparalleled, and it's single-handedly established portable gaming as a household platform. This version of the game is so iconic, it's where the Tetris theme that we all know and love came from. I'm not gonna explain how or what Tetris is, because it's fucking Tetris. Everyone knows Tetris. And if you don't, go get a Switch. Bitch. Tetris today has had hundreds of clones. It's been reskinned, retooled, and really remixed way too many times. But recently, it's reached a new popularity once again with the Nintendo Switch and Tetris 99. It's great to see that even today, Tetris is still as popular as ever. But thanks to the Game Boy, Tetris is the household portable game that everyone can love and cherish to this day. That's my top 10 launch titles. I know it was a weird one. It was a doozy. I know we've done a lot of top 10s on this channel before, and I still don't feel as if I've scratched the surface with the potential of these topics. So in order for me to gauge interest, please tell me what are your ideas that you're most jazzed about to hear from me. Sound off in the comments down below. And at the very least, tell me what your top 10 launch titles are. That's it, that's all guys. We'll see you this week for the brand new episode of The Completionist. Buh bye bye